morning. Welcome to Stanford. Welcome to Silicon Valley. We're glad you're all here. I'm not going to make you all count off, but there's supposedly there are 208 people registered for this uh, conference, which is pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I think I'd like to make a few remarks and then uh, conclude with a little of a housekeeping of my own, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, uh, in welcoming you to Stanford and welcoming you to Silicon Valley, I really mean that. Uh, we have in this uh, circumference of maybe uh, 25 miles a lot of talent, uh, much of it having come from Stanford or going to Stanford, and the interaction that has made uh, both Stanford and Silicon Valley so productive in so many innovative ways is a result of this marvelous interaction. It's been uh, simply an amazing uh, set of events for so many decades. We have um, regularly visits from busloads full of folks from other places, uh, particularly national um, uh, visit visitations, wanting to know what the secret sauce is. And I'll tell you what the secret sauce is. It's really quite simple. In my view, the secret sauce is that we never put down an idea or a person with an idea. We always, always consider whether an idea has merit. We may reject the idea. We may, may reject 95% of the ideas, but we do examine the ideas to see whether or not they have some value for us. So as you proceed with your meetings these next days, please keep that in mind. Uh, don't put down the person. Consider the idea and keep, keep rolling. Keep making it happen. Stanford's been involved with web archiving for rather a long time. I'm uh, very proud of uh, something that was started here a long time ago uh, by David Rosenthal and Vicki Reich, known as LOX, Lots of Copies Keep Stuff Safe. It's a marvelous uh, engine, uh, one that is uh, lots of adherence and is being used in, um, in public ways and in private ways. Uh, you know, of course, about WebBase, uh, the, the uh, very large uh, collection of websites that Sergey Brin and Larry Page used in developing uh, their own service, which we all know, of course, as Google and PageRank. Uh, by the way, um, the computer science department is trying to get us to take over uh, WebBase in the Stanford Digital Repository, uh, which we will, we will do especially if we can get some money to support it. It's a, it's a big gulp, yeah, really, really. Um, and, and yet we're also uh, new in web archiving. Uh, we've started a couple of years ago uh, a web archiving program driven by our curators uh, with, a, with a good staff based in our digital library systems and services group, which is led by um, Tom Kramer. Tom, where are you? That man right there. Um, Several things to say about web archiving from our perspective. The first, of course, is that it is curatorially driven. Uh, we are selecting websites that we believe are important for us to preserve for, to capture and preserve for Stanford's programs. We see ourselves also as cultural custodians, so we're, we're anxious to work with others and cover the waterfront in some kind of coordinated way. Um, and that, is, that could be on a global basis. Uh, I have to say as well that discovery, the possibilities of, of discovering uh, a, a collection of web um, pages under a website in a digital archive is really, really important. It is not acceptable, in my view, for a memory organization, cultural custodians such as uh, we are here at Stanford, to collect websites and not make them easily discoverable. And that includes the addition of, of uh, metadata, um, looking at the headers of uh, HTML pages, and adding uh, critiques and comments and even articles on the subject, uh, the individual subjects. It's of particular um, uh, perversity in our society, in American society, that the average uh, uh, life of a government web page is 90 days. This is not good. <clears throat> and apparently the government is going to try to fix it. So the rest of us who are interested in those uh, documents those government uh, emanations, need to get together and, and save them. Another principle that I'm very much wedded to, thanks to Dave Rosenthal, David Rosenthal's and Vicki Reich's uh, leadership in LOCKS, is that we need to have redundant storage of these websites. We need, to, we need to make sure they're in several different systems and available in several different ways 
and not just on one tectonic plate. Uh, we're very aware, of course, of the tragedy in Nepal. Uh, it's unlikely that a tragedy of that size would strike uh, this particular tectonic plate, but it's been known to happen at lesser uh, 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 seismic forces here at San Francisco and the Bay Area. So we need to be, we in particular need to be cognizant of that, but we all need to be aware of the problem set. <coughs> Finally, uh, it seems to me that we have uh, uh, a mutual interest in collecting in ways that are more or less not redundant so that we cover a greater part of the waterfront than we, we might individually. Certainly we at Stanford can't collect everything that we should and could and we simply don't have the time nor the storage. But among us, among the big memory organizations and the small ones too, we probably have plenty of horsepower to decide what to collect and collect on some kind of coordinated collection development basis. This is not new. Um, we've done it for, well, in the 40 some odd years that I've been in the business, there's been coordinated collection development for physical items. I think we need to uh, move over and work on the digital front, the web front uh, in that regard too. <coughs> Um, so, it is a particular um, pleasure to have you all here because we're going to learn from you. The folks that, that are here from Stanford will be uh, picking your brains, listening to your questions, listening to the presentations, introducing themselves, and hoping to get further along on this trail with you, and we hope you will be along with us. <coughs> Some housekeeping. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we look at the ideas uh, and imagine how they might be put to use. Please do that here. Uh, and please don't engage in any um, frivolous harassment of speakers. This doesn't often happen here, but uh, just to let you know, we don't want, to ha want that to happen. Some thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Vince Cerf and Mahadev Satya. Now, uh, Professor Satya tells me that uh, the extra syllables in his name are significant, but everyone calls him Satya, and we should all do that too. Satya, he tells me, means truth in Hindi? Sanskrit. Sanskrit. So uh, there's a true speaker right there. Uh, Kathy Marshall, thank you for, for coming and donating your time and your profiles and adding, uh, um, I would say, weight to this, uh, to this meeting. I want to thank folks from the Internet Archive for helping to organize and co-host this uh, General Assembly. Uh, I want to thank all the folks in the uh, IIPC and the California Digital Library for helping to organize it. Uh, we have um, uh, a room, as you can see, that's quite flexible, that uh, we have to thank the conference services and the Li Kai-shing uh, conference management staff for providing. And especially, I want to thank the uh, Army of Generals, some part of which are right here uh, today, that are the Stanford University Library staff. Alas, I have to go on to um, harass other people at the top of the food chain here, so I'm not going to be able to enjoy this, but I have lots of spies among you. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. So now we can gossip about you and your absence. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I think I'm always going to have Michael open up uh, our conferences because uh, you said everything I had written down, so it's fantastic. My job is made easy. Uh, my name is Paul Wagner. I'm uh, the uh, Senior Director General of Innovation and Chief Information Officer for Library and Archives Canada, and I'm also proudly the Chair of the Internet uh, Preservation Consortium for 2015. So welcome to your General Assembly. Um, I think as Michael's eloquently put, uh, this week is about dialogue. There may be some folks up here talking and, and generating some ideas and some thinking, but the value of this, uh, this event is going to come from the dialogues that happen both between the speaker and all of you and, uh, and out in, uh, in the other rooms and as we have lunch, coffees and so forth. So please take that opportunity. We've, we've got a, a, an action-packed week. I think this is a record uh, number of uh, attendees for a GA, so very proud of that. Um, I think we have about 200 people here today and 100 people for our member days. So that's, uh, we're very, very proud of that and happy to, uh, to do that. I think Vint and, uh, and Madhav, I think that's all because of you, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that after you leave and make sure that's uh, true, to, true to form. Um, the first two days are just a couple of quick pieces. The first two days are open days, so um, the, uh, today and tomorrow we'll have a number of, uh, of uh, topics of, of general interest, and then we have three days for the members where we're going to uh, dig a little bit deeper into some of the technical and, and non-technical sides of, uh, of web archiving. 
Um, and we did intentionally leave a lot of networking time in the agenda so that uh, you can all chat, get to know each other. Um, don't be shy. Uh, I think uh, we have representation from about 30 countries and about 50 institutions uh, over, the, uh, over the week. So uh, if, if there's somebody that you needed to talk to, they're probably here this week. A um, couple of small things, and then I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Uh, I'll ask these folks to stand up. Um, Jason Weber, Sabine Hartman, Jefferson Bailey, Nicholas Taylor, and Rosalie Lack. Now, if I could, I would put a, s a, a piece of paper on their back that says, kiss me, I'm an organizer. Um, that's the organizing team, folks. So if you can give them a round of applause. Um, if you have any questions, any concerns, um, the five of them or myself, uh, you can obviously uh, question us and we'll, uh, we'll set you up and make sure that you have a, uh, a successful week. Um, brilliant set of speakers for the week. We start off uh, with what's likely to be, a, I think, a very provocative discussion, hopefully. Um, and we've left some time for questions at the end uh, to, uh, to query what you've heard, challenge what you've heard, and, uh, and don't be shy to ask your questions, even though it is uh, filmed. So keep the swearing to a minimum, but the uh, provocative ideas to, uh, to a maximum. So without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll give me a couple of seconds just to introduce these folks. I think you've probably all Googled them, if, if, not, if nothing else. But our first speaker, I guess the tag team today, is Vince Cerf, uh, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google responsible for uh, new enabling technologies and applications of uh, the internet and other platforms for the company. Um, Vint uh, began his work at the United States uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, playing a key role leading development of internet and internet-related data packet and security technologies. Widely known as the father of the internet and driver of the Tesla, I guess, is, uh, after today. Uh, is the co-designer of uh, TCIP, TCP IP protocols, which uh, uh, certainly when I started looking into that, it was fantastic to, to uh, f finally shake a hand and uh, talk to somebody that builds things that I've worked on for 20 years. So, um, In 97, President Clinton recognized uh, their work with uh, a U.S. National Medal of Technology, um, and you received the highest civilian honor bestowed in the U.S., which is the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So congratulations. Um, and it recognizes, obviously, the fact that your work on software code using to, to move data across the internet uh, put them at the forefront of the digital revolution. And he holds a PhD in computer science from UCLA. Um, wanted to go to Stanford, but that didn't work out. And uh, more than a dozen, <laughs> more than a dozen honorary uh, doctorate degrees. And uh, co-speaking uh, co with him, Madhav Satya Narai Nan. Not bad. Uh, thankfully known as Satya, um, is an experimental computer scientist, pioneered research in distributed systems, mobile computing, and pervasive computing. Uh, early in his career, he was principal architect and implementer of Andrew File System, still in play today, which pioneered the use of scalable file caching, access control lists, uh, based security, and volume-based administration. Uh, he's the Carnegie Group Professor uh, of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, received a PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon, uh, after a bachelor and master's degrees uh, from the Indian, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. Uh, he's a fellow of the Association of Computer Machinery for the IEEE, um, and uh, I think he's going to be speaking today about a project uh, called Olive, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so a collaborative project seeking to establish uh, a system where we can actually pres preserve software, games, and other executable content. Um, with that, I'll say his, his mantra, or one of his mantras, he probably has many, is working code trumps all height. So We'll see, if the, we'll see if the code works today. Um, I was lucky enough to meet David Fricker, who's the uh, head of the uh, Australian Archives, and uh, one of the things that he said a couple of weeks ago was, paper is patient, digital is not. And so with that, I give you Vint and Madev. So first test, is this thing on? Am I audible in the back? Uh, the, the usual question is, can you hear me back there in the rear? And the correct answer is no, we ain't built that way. So first of all, I need to apologize that I can only be here for the morning. I really am uh, unhappy about that, but my calendar just is too packed. So uh, I'm going to rely on many of you who will be here during the course of the week to uh, capture any really important ideas and share them, please, because this area of preservation is a super hard problem, and it's one that needs attention. And on that point, uh, I am, you know, Sacha and I are, are going to do a, a sort of a, a duet here. I'm the problem. He's the solution. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to give you any solutions. I'm just going to whine for a little while, and then Sacha will come and explain how to fix the problem. 
Uh, the term digital vellum, by the way, is just a, a catchphrase. You know that vellum is, uh, you know, sheepskin or goatskin and so on, and it's actually a fairly durable material. In fact, you have people s uh, scraping off the ink and reusing the vellum, uh, the, the resulting in palimpsests and things like that. And if you have not done your homework, please look up the Archimedes palimpsest because it's an absolutely amazing story about some incredibly important Greek uh, materials that were could have been lost but were rediscovered uh, in the uh, 1900s and then uh, recorded and, uh, and interpreted uh, around the 1998 to the present. So it's a, it's a great story to, to read about. So digital vellum is not just a physical material, but it's a framework in which digital content can be preserved over long periods of time and uh, remain meaningful. So let me start out by reminding you that we have all kinds of formats and materials in which we have recorded static content. Uh, we have cuneiform baked tablets. Sometimes I don't think they were intentionally baked. Sometimes this was fires that, that baked the clay. Uh, but the result was preservation over several thousand years. Uh, there is a papyrus, which is not inherently uh, long-lasting, but sometimes it ends up in dry caves in the desert, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they have lasted for a substantially long period of time. Vellum, of course, has held up very, very well over long periods of time. Uh, of course, that's static content, but now, of course, we have more dynamic content, uh, which is available in a variety of places like Picasa, Flickr, YouTube, and others. So uh, static and dynamic content are both things that we are concerned about, and you all know, of course, that the dynamic content of movies uh, has been a challenge to preserve. Th you know, things like the early uh, acetate materials are explosive over time. If you know, talk about blockbusters, you know, that's not what they had in mind. So uh, preserving this material is a tricky business. I want you to imagine it's the 22nd century and you're Doris Kearns Goodwin, you know, great-granddaughter. And you remember she wrote this wonderful book called The Team of Rivals about uh, Lincoln hiring all of his uh, competitors uh, for the presidency. The question is, how did she manage to reproduce the dialogue in the books? I mean, she does a, re a remarkable job of recreating what must have been, uh, well, she wasn't there uh, 150 years before, so she recreated dialogue, which I thought was very plausible. Well, she went to a lot of different libraries around the country and got the physical correspondence of the principals who were uh, portrayed in the book, figured out you know, from those um, uh, exchange of letters what the topics were, what the positions were of these various parties, and then regenerated uh, a plausible dialogue. The question is, if you're the 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin, how would you write about the beginning of the 21st century? I think it would be a real challenge because the email would have evaporated unless somebody printed it out somewhere and, and kept it in the appropriate archives, and maybe our friends at the Internet Archive will help with that. But it isn't enough. Uh, will, the, what, will the National Archives have anything available? You know, those poor folks get these hard disk drives with stuff on them and they have to figure out which operating system was running and what the file formats were and which applications produced the content and so on. I think it's a very big open question whether our 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin could do anything comparable to what her uh, 20th century counterpart was able to do because there's so much that goes on now in the digital realm. Now, we do save digital materials, right? You know, we have eight-inch uh, floppy long disk drives or disks and, and the drives that, uh, that uh, could read them. We have five and a quarter inch floppies, three and a half inch floppies. We have uh, VHS. I'm sure everybody here has a VHS, uh, you know, uh, VCR reader. Uh, and there's DVDs and Blu-ray, and I'm sure you're really happy that the Macintoshes in the room probably don't have readers for those devices anymore. Uh, and then, of course, there's these, uh, you know, separate disk drives. You can buy three or four terabytes of disk drive for $150. I mean, it should all be wonderful, right? We have all these high-density, uh, low-cost storage capabilities. The problem is that the devices that can read them may not last all that long. And I can remember being embarrassed once. I was uh, touting this uh, a DVD with whatever it was, 7.4 gigabytes or 4.7 gigabytes of data on it, in a group kind of like this, made up mostly of librarians, and uh, was saying, look at this wonderful high-density storage, this is really great. And one of the librarians got up and left the room, came back with a, a manuscript from 1000 AD, beautifully illustrated, 
and then looked at me and said, and how long will your polycarbonate thing last? And you know, I sort of felt like crawling out of the room there at that point. So we have a big problem with longevity of the media and longevity of the things that can read it. Now, of course, there's Google. We could always supply you with these giant data centers, but will we be around 300 years from now? In fact, there are all kinds of sources of digital material, and we all use them every single day. We generate enormous quantities of this stuff, and we rely on a lot of software to make it understandable. So in addition to that, we're, we're now having this avalanche of Internet of Things coming along, all kinds of devices that are generating or consuming or uh, displaying content like uh, Internet-enabled picture frames. By the way, you know, the cybersecurity stuff is a big deal these days, and I can't resist pointing out that uh, the, the grandparents love these Internet-enabled picture frames, right? Because the, uh, the pictures of the grandchildren and so on get uploaded to a website, and then their picture frame downloads them, and you get up in the morning and see what the nieces and nephews and grandchildren are doing until somebody hacks the website, and then the grandparents will be seeing pictures of what they hope is not the grandchildren. <laughs> so uh, security turns out to be important at home as much as it is at work. There are all kinds of things that are becoming part of the digital world. This guy with an internet-enabled surfboard has actually put a laptop in the surfboard so he can surf the internet while he's waiting for the next wave. So, you know, if you're interested in surfing the net while you're out on the water, that's for you. Uh, what about executable content? Not just static, not just dynamic, but stuff that's executable. Think of all the games that we play that require the interpretation of software in order for the uh, experience to actually unfold. Um, there are all kinds of things that rely on software to be interpreted, whether it's uh, text documents or you know, presentations or uh, spreadsheets or other kinds of more complex things. Every single day, we execute software which generates complex file formats, which cannot be interpreted without the benefit of that application software. And oh, by the way, it's not just the application software that we're relying on. We're relying on the operating system that could house that application software. And we're relying on a piece of hardware that can run the, app the uh, operating system that can run the application that can interpret the bit. And so we are dependent on a lot of things working for our digital material to be accessible and useful to us. Now, there are places like around the corner here, the Computer History Museum, where digital hardware is actually maintained and in some cases actually works. There's a PDP-1 where you can play Space War at the Computer History Museum. I tried it a few months ago and I was just as bad now as I was back in when I was playing Space War here on this campus back in the, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, but there aren't any places yet to store software except for the Internet Archive, which I guess is starting to do that. And there are a few other places where software might be archived. You know, the wineries have libraries where they keep every vintage of their wine. Some of the computer makers and software makers might actually have libraries full of their software, although honestly I don't know that for, for a fact, and I'm not even sure Google keeps its old software particularly long if it isn't in use anymore. So we don't have a place to store this software which might be useful to us in the future. There are lots of challenges before us. This is the, I'm the whining guy now, uh, to looking to Sacha to solve the problem. First of all, there's just interpreting the bits. You need software to help you do that. Second, if you wanted to keep the software, suppose you have uh, an operating system and an application and you'd like to hang on to that, uh, and you know that it might not run in the future because there might not be any hardware that will run the old operating system in the application. So you ask the owner of the software, can I have a copy? And they might say, uh, no. Or you might say, can I have a source code? And then they say, hell no. Uh, and, you know, but, but you're not supporting it anymore. We don't care. Half of it is in the new version of our software, and so we're not giving you anything. So there's all kinds of problems there. Then there's the question about how you manage to bootstrap your way into operating an old operating system running on a piece of hardware that wasn't, it wasn't designed to run on. That's one of the problems that Sasha is going to explain a solution for. There are questions about legal frameworks. Intellectual property is a big deal. You know about patent trolls and, and software patents, which are a giant headache these days. But there are also issues about who has access to what under copyright. Copyright law has been extended over time to something like 75 years after the death of the author. 
which I personally think is too long. There's something wrong with it. It's out of balance relative to the other benefit, which is to turn things over to the public domain. But it's going to be really hard to get access to uh, this kind of source code if you need it or even the object code. So I think that there should be some serious thought given to giving preservation some rights that it doesn't have today the same way fair use evolved after uh, hard, uh, what is it, uh, dry copying and Xerox machines came along and drove the need for that regime. So I think there should be a preservation regime in copyright, which today is not yet instantiated. Uh, there are big issues about s bankruptcies and sunsetting of support for software that lead to the need for access to source code or at least uh, uh, interpretable object code. And finally, we need to have the capacity to store a lot of this stuff. And so we need to be able to store large amounts of content, and we need to be able to store it away in a reliable fashion. So the solution to the problem is not to drink a large martini with an olive in it, although I am tempted to do that. The solution is Satya's design and implementation for interpretation of old software. So Satya, I'll turn this over to you. Can you all hear me at the back? Great. So thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. And I want to tell you about Olive. So what is it that makes execution of very old software difficult? What is the core of the problem? The answer is there are many, many moving parts. And every one of them have to be perfectly aligned for the execution to work exactly as it should. And I refer to that property as execution fidelity. So you need to have uh, your hardware, the operating system, the dynamically linked libraries, even configuration parameters can change how you, even the time zone can make a difference. If you have something that is not quite exactly right, the thing falls apart. So you can heroically get all these things right, get it working, um, but shortly thereafter, it falls apart. And the notion that you could, 100 years from now, take a random piece of software and get it working perfectly <coughs> is really not a very credible game, claim. So what's the solution? How, how do we even go about this? So my observation begins by recognizing that we computer scientists are very poor at coping with complexity. We're very good at generating complexity, but we're not very good at coping with it, okay? But we are good at one thing, and that is scaling. I mean, think of Google, right? If you think of the core of its search engine, there is a lot of cleverness, but right at the heart of it is an enormous scaling effort. So the concept of packaging up the transitive closure of everything you depend on and taking it with you is really the essence of Olive. And this includes the operating system, any libraries, sometimes even an emulator for your hardware. This all sounds good, but you pay a price when you do transitive closure, and that is the sizes of the things that you create are huge. A typical virtual machine is multiple gigabytes. At typical internet speeds, if you have to wait for the thing to be downloaded, it's many tens of minutes, maybe hours, depending on how bad your connectivity is. And after you run it, in five seconds you discover this isn't quite what I wanted. And that's not a usage model that is very reasonable. So the approach that Olive takes is to borrow an idea from YouTube. You don't actually have to sit around and wait for the whole movie to be downloaded. It's streamed to you. There's a short, brief delay initially while you stream it, and then what happens is the playing of the movie and the prefetching of other parts of it happen behind the back. And except in rare occasions when the bandwidth takes a hit for the worse or other similar situations, you hardly notice this. So quick launch and responsiveness are critical. Unfortunately, video is a lot easier than programs. Programs have these strange things called users who behave in unpredictable ways. You never know what mouse click will be next. You don't know what keystrokes will be submitted. Um, data content, which in fact 
uh, modifies program execution also matters. So the approach that Olive takes is to borrow again very old and classic ideas from computer science, which is to say, you know, we invented demand paging half a century ago, and the concept of prefetching about the same time. Fast forward to today, those ideas, obviously in, in highly modified flavors, are really the essence of what Olive is all about. You prefetch, you cache persistently on your disk, and the net effect of this is that you have a usage experience that is quite similar to watching a YouTube movie. So if the demo gods are with us today, I'll actually show you a live demo. So typically, you fire up a browser, and you go to the Olive page, by the way. It's called olivearchive.org. And you notice that I have to be authenticated. On the top right, you see my name. At the moment, for all the legal reasons that Vint mentioned, if you were to go to this website, you would see everything except the virtual machines because I don't yet have permission to share them with all of you, though I would love to. If I go to the browse part, it shows me a list of um, virtual machines. There are many pages of them. And I want to emphasize that this is standard browser technology. There's absolutely nothing innovative. All of Olive is condensed into one button, this button called Launch. And so if I click it, there it is. This is an executing instance of Microsoft uh, uh, Office Suite from 1993, running on Windows 3.1 on my machine. Okay, So if I were to fire up, uh, let's say, PowerPoint, what was slide technology like in 1993? tells you, would you like a little tour? And so let's take this tour. OK, got everything you need. Remember these things back in 1993? Everything you need. You can create black and white overheads, <laughs> on-screen presentations. This is what laptops looked like in 1993. And 35-millimeter slides, OK? They also reproduced the Apple graphics, too. Look at the uh, right. <laughs> so, so it's fun. Now, you might think, why would, why would anyone need to really do this? Let me give you a real case study, OK? 20 years ago, in the late 1980s, one of my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon, Professor David Miller, put an enormous amount of time uh, with some foundation funding to create a program to teach students American history from the eight, 19th, late 18th and early 19th and late 19th century. And so he called it the Great American History Machine. And it's shown here, the last of those virtual machines. It ran on Windows 3.1. He created a version with the help of the University of Maryland. Worked beautifully, was used in many courses all over the country. Worked on Windows 95, 98, XP. And then by Windows 7, it stopped working. There was no money to sustain it. And so this was an orphaned piece of software. And professors, history professors all over the country asked, gee, is there any way you could make it work? And so when he heard of Olive, he came to us, he had the original CD-ROM, and he said, could you get this to work? So we tried, and here is the result. As you notice, it says University of Maryland, because those are the folks who wrote the software. Um, if I say file, it says, which data set do you want to open? And I'll say, 19th century history, and it says, notice that it has presidential election data, census data, let's say 1840 census, um, and let's say we are interested in the distribution of male slaves by age. Male slaves, 24 to 35. This is the graphics for Windows 3.1. Notice that California doesn't exist. Okay, nothing exists west of the Mississippi. Uh, the portions in blue are above the Mason-Dixon line, so there's no slavery there. Um, you can double-click, and you can see um, whatever the 
the graphics of uh, 1993 was in Windows 3.1. So here's a piece of software, Orphan software, that has value to people, but there aren't resources to keep up with the march of technology. And we've been able to bring it back to life, and hopefully some people can find value out of this and maybe still use it in courses. So I have TurboTax up there from 1997, and I can run it for you, and it'll help you do your taxes just like it was my personal copy. I did my taxes uh, with that. Um, you may wonder, why would anyone ever want that? If there's a piece of software that gets obsolete every year, it's TurboTax, right? Because by definition, it's a perfect business model. The tax code changes just enough that it's a guaranteed lifetime employment for the company. But here's an example. Suppose you were teaching a course on um, political uh, impact or, or economic impact of political decisions or political science or things like that. And you want to give an assignment for people to really understand the impact of tax code changes on real people. How do you do that? Well, here's an example. I could create a question that says, consider the Smith family, the Jones family, and the XYZ family. This is the family profile and income profile of the Smith family. This is that of the David family, and this is that of the third family. Do their taxes doing using TurboTax 1997? Repeat using TurboTax 2007. What was the impact of the tax code changes in those 10 years on these three families? What does it tell you? Now here we have converted a rather dull, esoteric piece of knowledge and, and um, understanding into something that people can learn firsthand. And I think it's well known that the ability to translate abstract material into practical, workable material is a big part of what it takes to make this material accessible. So one of the nice things about all these examples is that the original versions of these software, by good fortune, were created on Intel x86 hardware. And that's what my laptop is currently running. So in 20 years, the hardware hasn't changed, and so I'm able to execute it. What happens if the hardware changes. So here is Oregon Trail. Has anyone in this room ever played Oregon Trail? <laughs> I might call upon one of you because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so let's say launch. Okay? And what you're seeing here is actually a Linux virtual machine. The reason it is Linux is because Macintosh in 1993 did not run on x86. It did not run on PowerPC. It ran on Motorola 68XX hardware. Now, fortunately for us, in the open source community, there were people out there who created an open source emulator for Motorola 68040 on x86 hardware. They did it for some other reason. I have no idea why they did it, but they did it, and I'm grateful for it. All we did was we took their code, put it inside this virtual machine, which is a Linux virtual machine, and then we took the hard disk of a 1993 Macintosh, and it's located on that path name inside this virtual machine. And when I say start, that emulator is booting up a 1993 Macintosh. And there is the Oregon Trail. And I never played this, so I've only learned this while giving this demo. So uh, you know, one of you who's better than me can probably do a much better job. But you, know, you can buy four oxen, maybe 10 boxes of bullets. Maybe it won't let you start without food. So I have to say 500 pounds of food. By which month? What month is it now? April. And it tells me. Okay, head out, and there we are, crossing you know, the Midwest, and at some point, presumably, we'll get to uh, some obstacle, and then the game will give us some choices and tell us what to do. Now, this is the original game. 
we didn't have the source code. Apple certainly didn't make any deals with me. Okay? And um, the ability to do this using the binaries, the original executable installable code. So we're now at the Kansas River crossing and it wants me to do something. What does it want me to do? It wants me to either ford the river or hawk the wagon and float it and take the ferry for five dollars. That's expensive in 18 whenever 40. I'll try to ford the river. No, no. <laughs> you know, I lost all kinds of things. There's burying and mourning the dead. <laughs> you get the point, okay? Now, this is the internet organization. And one of the things that really made this, the founding of this organization, was the web browser. And the world's first web browser was Mosaic. How many of you in this room have actually used Mosaic? Wow, wow, that's a great. So we actually found a Mosaic browser. And so I can launch it. Once again, I could only find it for the Macintosh. And so I do the same thing that I did. We have a Linux outer virtual machine. And then when I launch this Macintosh, come on. Sometimes it needs encouragement. There you are. Now, this is live, okay? So I can actually go to open URL. This browser hasn't seen the light of day since whenever, 1993. So it only understands web pages that are vintage web pages, and one of them is my own. say? Did I mistype that? So if I were to give it a, let me try an old one, HTTP. It needs you to type this perfectly. No errors. <laughs> okay. I can barely see on the screen, so. that right. Does that look right? Or did I see it for cmi.edu? Let's try that. Bingo. Okay, it's a real web page. Now, if I were to go to a modern web page, okay, so if I were to say HTTP colon, what is this, IIPC.org? netpreserve.org. I haven't tried this before, so I have no clue what will happen. Does it use JavaScript? Does it use cascading style sheets? Okay, it's going to choke. <laughs> okay, but the important point is that I have a live code that is, that is examining uh, the internet. You could teach students the evolution of the internet Right? Live and tell them. I also have Netscape Navigator in the interest of time. I'll, I'll not go there, uh, but it works just like Mosaic. When we were doing this, one of our colleagues who was in the chemistry department came to us and said, you know, we have this odd problem. Um, we have, let me see if I can find it here. Yes, Chem Collective. So let me fire up a browser window and I can go to chemcollective.org. This is, you can go to this. You can, on your browsers, on your laptops, you can go here. It's created to teach chemistry. So it's funded by the NSF, many universities use this. Maybe Stanford has something similar or uh, uses it. Um, come on, it's not that hard. The real web is giving trouble here. Come on. Let me try the web page again. Okay. 
so far so good. Okay, and we recently update, updated our site. If you have problems, you can click here to get to the old site. All right, let's go to the old site. Wow, that's a really old site. Anyway, these guys, I have no idea why the live site isn't working, but maybe the olive frozen version of it will work. They came to us and said, you know, we keep changing our site. It would be really nice if you could freeze a specific version of the website, like it was, say, two years ago, and then we could go back to it every time and look at it, right? So could you do that? So here's what we did. We took the state of chemcollective.org, the whole website, as of, I think, a year and a half ago, and we made a virtual machine out of it. Now, the hard part is what do you do with all the links? Because they all point to chemcollective.org. We fixed the IP routing tables in this virtual machine so that all of them get redirected back to the VM. Okay? And so you saw just now, right, I didn't make this up, right, that <laughs> this part, when I clicked on acid-based chemistry, this part did not work on the live website, but it does in my virtual machine. Um, I can do exercises, right, determining the concentration of the unknown acid. Um, you can do things like, uh, you know, put beakers on your, and so on. This is, this is code that they wrote. But this gives us an important point, right? I mean, for legal reasons, I can imagine for liability reasons, all kinds of reasons. As we move to web-based versions of software, it may be important to actually be able to say, on this date, when I interacted with this website, the software which is only available in web form, this is the answer that it gave me. And I built my plane or my bridge using the answers that it gave me, and here's the proof. Because in the 10 years or so that have passed since that happened, the software has changed dramatically. I'll give you one last demo, and then I'd like to make a few more points and turn it back to Vint after that. Um, here is a piece of software that comes from a publication, an open source publication, which accepts software contributions. So it's uh, a 2013 publication for doing computational physiology and botany. And so this is the paper, the PDF, you can see it there. You can, it's open access, so you can get it. And what this software lets you do is to generate videos, video frames. So that is a animation of, at the molecular level, of what happens in your small intestine. Those little projections are villi, okay? Uh, and, and I don't know the color coding, but uh, you know, there's oxygen molecules, other molecules, et cetera. So, each frame of this video is individually generated, and for a 30-second video, it takes about 24 hours of computation time. So this is, this is what they've provided. Now, the interesting part is they provided the open source source code for that. And in two years, since 2013, it's already the case that the code is not compilable. Okay? Before you can get it to build, because the Linux environment has changed, you have to go back, change a few things, etc. So imagine how bad it's going to be 50 years from now, or 100 years from now. What we did was inside this virtual machine, have a frozen version of the libraries and everything that it depended on and the compiler, so that when you say build, when I say set up software.sh, it's creating in this virtual machine, using the tools as of the time it was built, a version of the software. And it'll run, and you know, if you want to make a one-line change to see if it's useful, you can make it inside there without spending weeks of effort bringing it forward, okay? Now, if, if I let this continue, it'll, it'll build the whole thing. You can see that it's starting to do the C compilation. So I hope I have shown you that the ability to do everything I said is not, is not hypothetical. It actually worked. This is a live demo, right? This is not a video. 
So how do we do it? How much time do I have? 20 minutes, okay, good, great. Okay, so here's how it works. At the bottom, you have today's hardware, x86. Then you have Linux, which we haven't touched, there are no modifications to Linux. And then layer four, which you see up there, is a virtual machine monitor. That comes standard with Linux, KVM, here and here. The only part we have added, and it's GPL v2 software, is this component called VMNetX, which does the demand paging and prefetching. And then we have done a little bit of hooks in MIME types so that the browser, instead of launching Acrobat for PDF, when it sees one of our executables, it launches VMNetX. And so the rest of it is standard browser technology. We have achieved this using a minimalistic approach. Now, all of the stuff you see at the bottom is the stuff that you have to keep up to date 50 years from now, 100 years from now. This is where most of the effort lies. The stuff above layers five through eight, the curation of it happens once. And if you've done a good job, and if the bottom part of it has been correctly advanced over time, then you're guaranteed that the prepackaged world of the virtual machine will execute correctly. And so one way to think of this is the following. Suppose I had 10 virtual machines. Then the cost of maintaining the base is amortized over just 10 things. But if I had a hundred of them, or a thousand of them, or a million of them, as I have more content in the system, the cost of maintaining the underlying base of VMNetX is effectively the marginal cost per archived content becomes smaller, okay? Which is the right model that you want for archival preservation. Uh, if I were to look at the mapping of that picture onto a physical machine, this is what you would see. We use the fuse layer, we redirect references to the user level, and all of our code is user level code. There's no kernel modification whatsoever, okay? And the communication between the client and the server is pure HTTP. We have been able to use range requests in HTTP so that even though a virtual machine might be multiple gigabytes, any one access can be to just a tiny part of it. And of course, we use persistent caching on disk so that after I fetch any stuff on this machine, for the future, as long as I don't clear the cache, I don't have to refetch it, okay? So my next launch will be faster uh, because I already prefetched it. On the server side, there is absolutely nothing new. You can use standard web, servers like Apache or Nginx. In fact, I think we use Nginx on our servers. The web page happens to be enormous. Instead of having HTML in it, it has a description of the machine. It's a domain Excel. It says, I'm an x86. I have this CPU flags on. This is how much memory you should configure with, etc. All that stuff is described here. And also, I hope you noticed that when I ran many of those virtual machines, you didn't see Windows booting up. It was as if you opened your laptop and you had suspended the software. That's exactly what we do. We basically suspend ready to go so that when you launch, the launch delay to get you running in the specific software is as little as possible. And so there's a both a memory image as well as a disk image that's included here. Now, I have showed you today the situation where the execution happens on my laptop, can happen in a desktop. But if you go back to the web browser, and I were to say, whoops, this one, say we were to go to mm, Chaste, the one that I just showed you. Notice when I clicked, I clicked on the left side, which was launch on my endpoint on my desktop. 
I could also launch in the cloud. And it could be the archive back in Pittsburgh at CMU, or it could be a local cloudlet, maybe a, a, any machine that has been designated as a private cloud locally can be used as the target. You have to pre-configure it, but you can add its IP address and it'll run there. So if I were to click on Hello Archive, you can't really tell that this is executing remotely, except that when you interact with it now, every keystroke, every mouse movement now has the end-to-end -end delay to wherever it is executing. Okay? So in this case, it's back in Pittsburgh, so I'm ex experiencing end-to-end -end delay of the internet. If it were close by, then I would merely have maybe one hub wireless uh, internet delay. So, going back to our slides. This is how it works. All of the machinery that is used for local execution is getting executed in the cloud. So you can imagine a future in which Amazon or Microsoft Azure or somebody is willing to make the computational resources available, or it could be a private institution like Stanford for all its students and faculty could make that available. So two points I want to make, which I think important for archival use, that there is very clean separation of the storage and retrieval of the archival VM images from the execution of them, okay? I think that's important because when you factor in both the stability and the cost of operating any kind of facility, the ability to separate these is a big difference. And secondly, the entire Olive stack, the portion below the virtual machine is open source. And I believe that both of these are important as Vint pointed out you know, Google is doing well today. Will it be here 50 years from now? Who knows? 100 years from now? 500 years from now? I think ultimately the, the basis of archiving this content has to be something that is not the proprietary uh, intellectual property of anybody. Now, <laughs> I've shown you demos, things work. Are we done? No. I can spend the rest of this a uh, uh, whole morning telling you all the many ways in which what is currently working is inadequate. But you know what? Think back to the start of air travel. You know, a, a, a DC-3 was not uh, 787. You know, its range was shorter, it used old-fashioned uh, engines, it, it had limited capacity, its service ceiling, but you know, it was usable. So I think of Olive in its present form like a DC-3. Uh, there's plenty of improvements yet to be made in many, many dimensions, uh, some of which I've listed on this slide in the interest of time I won't go through, but um, uh, there's work to be done. I want to conclude and then hand back to Vint here. When we invented writing, I don't know when we invented it, but at some point in the past, independently, many cultures in invented writing, we learned that creating repositories for writing output was important. And things like the Library of Alexandria and libraries in general arose out of that. And society, every society that had those repositories of information benefited. What is new in computing is execution. That is the truly new part. It is no longer the case that like a recipe for an omelet, I go read it and then I have to do the execution. You have executable content. The ability for society to capture, preserve, and recreate for posterity executable content is I believe fundamental to computer science. Imagine being able to go back to software that was written by somebody in 1970, say on climatology, and they made predictions about various things in 2015 and they didn't come about. Was that because the model was wrong? Or the data they had in 1970 was so poor that that model couldn't do any better? If we had an archived VM of their software, I could supply it with better data, find the predictions, 
And now I have a better understanding of whether it was the model or whether it was the incorrect data that's the source of the discrepancy. That's a new kind of science that I believe will help us advance better. And so with that, I turn it back to you. It doesn't get better than that, Sasha. That's a fabulous demonstration that it's possible to do this. I mean, if you come into my office and told me, show me the picture of the, of the virtual machine and the prefetching and all the other stuff, I probably would have thrown you out saying this isn't going to work. Uh, but it, obviously it does. And as Sasha says, there's still a lot more to be done. So uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say except that we really need to tackle this. We need to make this real. We need to make it supported. We need to find business models that will allow this kind of work to proceed. We need business models that will allow long-term preservation of digital content to be realistic. It's one of the biggest problems we have. Uh, despite the appeal of the locks idea, there still has to be some business model that will make sense, that will cause uh, a sustainable archive to be there 100, 1,000, or 3,000 years from now. So there's a lot to be done there, both in the legal, the financial, the business model side, and on the technological side. It's my understanding that we actually have time for some Q&A. And so I'd like to invite Sacha back up again. He probably has better answers than I do on anything technical. But I actually have a question for Sacha. Uh, as I look at the image that you showed of the, um, uh, the, the memory and the uh, object code and so on, I started to get this kind of crawly feeling about well, how do you make sure that the bits that you stored away about this ancient machine actually make it into the virtual machine in the right format? Here's, here's what I'm wondering about. Is there some subtle binding of 32-bit uh, memories that would make this much harder to do if I was trying to emulate a 37-bit uh, you know, Elbrus uh, Russian computer from the 1960s. Is there, is there anything subtle going on, or no. do you, how do you deal with the correct delivery of the bits into the virtual memory of the machine? Right. Maybe you could say something about that. So, so, so the first thing I want to point out is Vint actually has addressed two aspects of the problem. One is to make sure that the virtual machine image that I saved in 2015 is bit for bit preserved and retrieved in 2150. And to me, this is what LockSS solves. If we could take all the virtual machines in the archives and put them, just like PDF files, into a system like LockSS, the integrity of those bits would be preserved. The second half is, uh, and I think it's an efficiency question, that on modern architectures, we're all powers of two, um, and um, if I were to emulate a machine which had some weird uh, word width, 36 bits like a PDP-10, for example, um, your software emulator would have to do all that in software. However, I wonder how many of you noticed the following. I showed you those Macintosh demos. You were seeing two layers of emulation, the Intel x86 virtual machine emulation, on top of that was pure software emulation by Bacillus, which was the 6804D emulator. And yet, when people see that, the biggest complaint they have is that they never recall the Macintosh is booting up so fast. <laughs> okay? This is the benefit of 18 years of Moore's Law. Okay? And this year is the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. So one thing we have going in our favor, assuming Intel and friends can keep pushing, and virtualization technology, remember, is being pushed by cloud computing. I'm merely leveraging software uh, that other people are improving continuously. So it seems to me that this approach has the right derivatives. Um, it will always be the case that weirdness will have to be software emulated, but I think Moore's Law helps us. So actually, I, I know there are probably questions here, but it's something just uh, triggers in my mind. What would happen if we were able to design the world's best virtual machine, something that's really flexible, and then build one? 
you know, ha actually have a physical machine designed specifically to do virtual, to virtualize uh, anything else. And then have a deal which says everybody who makes software must have a compiler that will compile for that virtual machine in addition to everything else. Uh, one could do that. What Intel did was obviously what companies do. They, they took an existing non-virtualizable platform, x86, and added the VT execution set, instruction set, to make it virtualizable. So they did what you said, except nowhere as cleanly as you did. If you could legislate and make it happen much more cleanly, I'm sure it would be more efficient and aesthetically better. Okay, uh, we could go back into time here and I would talk about IBM and all of its uh, virtualizing and emulations and everything else, but I wanna know if there's any questions from the rest of you. Yes, ma'am. There's a roving microphone on its way. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Satya, and all of it, all of us. It's a very interesting. That that was that was great. Thank you. Um, but I'm thinking about the software that you were showing, and a lot of that older software, and even some of the software that's still being used, was fairly encapsulated. It didn't need didn't have dependencies beyond the operating system, the hardware. But it seems like the trend nowadays is, is for software to have dependencies that go far out, you know, like Office 365, um, Clash of Clans, you know, all the modern video games. And so have you thought about that challenge of, of what to do about how do you save anything like that when you can't bring in all the dependencies? So, so another way to, to say that is we depend on the transitive closure of your dependencies being captured in the VM. And if that transitive closure includes things way out on the internet, how much of the internet are you going to capture and bring in, right? Now, I showed you the tip of the solution. When I showed you that Chem Collective uh, website that I captured a specific version of and put into a virtual machine. I believe we can build on that. Today, when I launch one of those, when I say launch, I launch one virtual machine a future version of Olive could launch an entire constellation of virtual machines. Each of those virtual machines would have to encapsulate one of the internet sites, which is a dependency. So if I had a uh, Microsoft 365 site, which is used, and then there is a Oracle database at you know, communication via ODBC at some other site and so on, you would have to separately encapsulate each of those, figure out at runtime what the communication setups are, construct an ensemble, and then when I click on launch, I would be launching not one VM, but effectively a microcosm of the internet it sounds horrible, <laughs> but that's what Moore's Law is for. That's, I don't see any better way of doing it. Okay, we have one over here, and then over here we have one here. Yes, the microphone's behind you. Hi, I'm um, Mark Weber, founder and curator of the Internet History Program at the Computer History Museum. And I did want to say that we actually do collect software. Uh, we have for a number of years. Uh, we have, I think, one of the first um, software curators at a major museum, uh, Al Caso at bitsavers.org. So he's been doing that since 2006. Um, we have a digital repository, which uh, we've been expanding, and actually my colleague, Andrew Berger, who's here, is the uh, uh, digital archivist for that. Um, and we're in the process of expanding our software efforts in a number of ways that will be announced. Uh, so that's very much an area of interest for us. About 60% of our collection is um, software, video, uh, documents, images, et cetera. So may I ask a question yeah. about that? So, but do people have to come to Mountain View to experience that software? Uh, depends on what it is. But yeah, we're in the process of building in more public access. That's mostly, and Andrew might correct me, but that's mostly preservation at this point. 
But but they have to come. The current thinking is to come physically to use it. No, no. Okay. I mean, that's not the plan at all. Okay. Um, we're also some of this is in concert <coughs> with. We're doing a major exhibit on the social impact of software, which will open in a year or so. <coughs> well, I'd like years. to offer Olive for your use. Yeah. Okay. We should uh, we should connect. So uh, I know there are a couple of other people with questions. I just want to make an observation that uh, there's an opportunity during the course of this week for some of you, anyway, who are interested in this, to think some more through strategies that we need to uh, put in place in order to make this kind of preservation possible. And the point about the, uh, the shift towards the cloud and the shift towards licensing of access to online software rather than giving you a copy of the software changes uh, some of the tactics that make sense for preservation and execution in the future. And so it, it really uh, needs some strategic attention here to figure out what should we be asking for? What ground rules should we be looking for? What kinds of policy should we be trying to, uh, uh, I won't use the word enforce exactly, let me say encourage, uh, that would allow us to achieve our objective? Uh, who else has a question now? Over here, yes sir. Uh, Would you like to uh, say who you are as well? Of course. My name is Jay Gattuso, uh, and I, I come from the National Library of New Zealand. Uh, and in fact, my question kind of segues quite nicely from that previous comment. Thank you very much. Uh, and it kind of, you mentioned earlier, what a comment you made was, we need to look at business models that support the long-term preservation of, of information. And I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with you. I think that's kind of why we're here. I, I wondered how then do we, as memory institutions, kind of work with uh, organizations such as Google yourselves to... Um, help preserve some of the services that you provide. And I'm thinking particularly about um, the emergency response uh, uh, equipment that you put down, which is um, incredibly valuable. I'm thinking in Nepal particularly. We used it um, to, to great effect in 2011. We had a, 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 an awful earthquake um, in, in Christchurch. Yes, we um, and, yeah. and you know, we, as a memory institution, we reached out to Google to say, hey, can we, when you've finished, when you've done your, your, your incredible on the ground work, can we put a nice bow around it and hand it over to somebody? And I wonder how we encourage you um, to make that part of your strategic direction. You just did. Thank uh, you. And, and let me say that, that I am very attracted to the idea that the cloud can become a kind of emergency response backup capability and the emulations being uh, an important part of that. This does leave open this question about if you needed, a, a, this is the clean closure of everything, if we needed to have a lot of data in place in order to act as that responsive uh, in emergency backup, then we would have to have had some continuous process whereby the requisite information is being accumulated. And then, of course, somebody will get all worried about privacy and content and so on. So maybe it's encrypted or something. But, but it's clear that there are a lot of little details that have to be worked out. It's kind of like the you know, that famous cartoon with all the math at the top and the math at the bottom and the middle it says, and then a miracle happens. <laughs> so, uh, I, but I like very much the idea that these kinds of large scale uh, resources could be put to work in that fashion. It's a very attractive thing. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two more. So yes, this gentleman right here and then behind you as well. Okay, yes sir. Hi, Nicholas Taylor, uh, Stanford University. I think your point about, uh, Satya, your point about scalability is really well taken, and I think that as a community that's setting out to archive the web, that's something we're very much focused on. I'm curious about, um, I heard you say that the cost of setting up the initial infrastructure is sort of amortized over time as you have incrementally more machines, and I'm wondering if that holds if it turns out that the incremental cost of curating each of those virtual machines preserving sort of each additional unit of data turns out to be actually pretty expensive, right? So if you have to do metadata and you have to do curation for each of the individual machines. That's what graduate students are for. Sorry. If, this, <laughs> if the scaling cost isn't actually in the, at that yeah. stage, not. L let me be clear about what I said was amortized. The cost of maintaining over decades yeah. Yeah. of the software below the virtual machine, that cost, mm -hmm. it's a non-trivial cost. You're going to have to have people like my team, you know, somebody else, maintaining that software for the future uh, and improving it. And as hardware changes and physical machines change, the virtual machines that it can support will have to also be extended. So that is an ongoing investment that has to be calculated. It is the cost of that that is amortized over all the virtual machines in your collection. There is no easy substitute 
for the effort involved in curating one of those virtual machines. So when I began this work, before I built my team, built any of these VMs, my thinking was, I think, like what most of you have in mind, which is curation is a, is a very scholarly process that a s small number of priests uh, do. I, I have come to the conclusion that this is totally wrong. We should allow crowdsourcing of virtual machines. And we should allow anybody who wants to contribute a virtual machine with suitable disclaimers about legal rights, you know, that they're not plagiarizing, that they're not using software they say they aren't using. So there needs to be some careful uh, control there. But, you know, you put a VM together, you're allowed to put it together, submit it. Let the crowd, you, let's use ideas from reviewing and, and, and ranking from, say, uh, uh, the web, like Amazon products. Somebody gives five stars saying this is a good product. Or somebody else says only one star because it was a disaster. So you can imagine an ecosystem of criti 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 critical evaluations of these VMs. And after a while, you know, Vint gets the reputation as being a master curator of VMs of a certain genre. And that person over there uh, is seen to be the real expert in producing something else. And this particular, there are five VMs that all claim to uh, uh, encapsulate Microsoft Word 6.0, but one of them has only three-star rating, but the other is five-star rating because, in fact, it does a better job. I think there are huge numbers of people who would eagerly, if given the opportunity, um, like to preserve something they worked on for posterity. Somehow it reminds me of uh, the movie Space Cowboys. <laughs> right? There are pieces of software around, and the pe only people who know how to deal with them are sort of getting onto the years where they're dying off. <laughs> exactly. I remember back in hot well. Right. <coughs> We have, do we have time for one more? One no? more, I think. One okay. more. One more. One more. That's this gentleman here. Yes. Hi, I'm Tobias Steinke, German National Library. Um, uh, um, maybe that uh, fits to the other uh, comments you, you had. Um, I understand that there's a lot of manual effort needed for each virtual machine to create. Yes. And that's not really feasible, I would say, for most of the uh, cultural heritage organizations with thousands and ten thousands of objects in their storage uh, to do uh, a virtual machine for each object. You, you mentioned uh, crowdsourcing might be one of the solution, uh, but do you consider uh, automatic process to automatically generate based on the object a suitable virtual machine for each object? I think to a certain degree it might be possible because uh, at some point, you have some kind of reference machines of a certain decade uh, that should be possible to run most of the objects that were sold at that time commercially to, to run on it. So maybe you, you could have a, a set of uh, reference machines as virtual machines and then try to fit which one might fit to the, to the object in, on hand. So your point about the cost of curation, I think, is, is right on target. I don't have any good answers. I can give you a couple of alternatives. One is it is possible that over time there are tools, either open source tools or proprietary tools, to make it easier to create virtual machines, to make sure that the transitive closure of everything you need has been captured, that simplify that process. So I could see tool creation being valuable. You could even imagine a future in which uh, today when I install software from a CD-ROM or from the web, I don't have the option to say, create me a VM. You could imagine that being the case. But I don't know how that is going to play out as more of the software goes to becoming web-based. Um, so I, I don't know all the answers, but those are relevant points that you're making. One last uh, point, if, if I could. Um, this idea has a certain scope. And as you sit here thinking about preserving digital content, please keep in mind that some digital objects have an almost unbounded scope. Take any web page with a bunch of hyperlinks in it and imagine trying to do the clean closure of every hyperlink and pulling in everything, which is what the Internet Archive tries to do in many cases. 
there are going to be digital objects for which it's going to be very hard to preserve their full meaning because you won't be able to pull in the, all the context, either technically because you don't have enough room or legally because you don't have access rights, imagine pointers to things that have stuff behind fire paywalls and so on. So let's not fool ourselves uh, as we uh, tackle this problem. There are going to be some things that just don't make any sense at all. Or if we see them as desirable, we're going to have to figure out how to overcome those obstacles. So uh, on behalf of both Sacha and me, thank you very much for letting us take time. I hope we've ignited some thinking uh, in your minds for the rest of the week. Well. <laughs> I think, is it is it fair to say that this is a world premiere of this tag team uh, discussion? So right. it happened yeah. here, folks, uh, IIPC. So thank you both. I think as uh, with small tokens, uh, thanks to our, our colleagues at the British Library, I think everything needs a good contingency plan, as you've mentioned. So we, we, we do have a quill in case. <laughs> um, and to go back to uh, the, the manuscript, some gold ink to uh, in oh, case. And fabulous. A, uh, and a, uh, a wax seal for both of you. So Perfect. thank you both. Thank Raja, you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. What a great opening. Um, well, uh, how do we follow that? Well, with a lovely break, and you can talk about all the fantastic things we've done.